If you look at almost any data set, be it income, the national debt, inflation, stock prices, the growth of political partisanship, increasing divorce rates, you name it, the trajectory of the major trend lines for life as we know it changed massively in the early 1970s. Now, this led our guest experts on the program today to create the website What the F Happened in 1971.com to find out the answer as well as much, what's most likely to happen from here, keep watching this video. Oh, and always take a second and click the like button below here to help us continue the run of amazing guests we've had on this program. The more likes these videos get, the more big names we're able to attract. And now let's get started watching this week's market update featuring the founders of What the F Happened in 1971.com. Hello, everybody. Adam Taggart here, co-founder of Peak Prosperity, welcoming you back for another week of trying to make sense of these markets. Well, look, I've been asking our viewers to provide feedback on what type of guest experts they'd like to see on this program going forward. And we got a number of requests for our guests today. Um, there's a website that's been circulating in the internet recently called uh, uh, WTF Happened in 1971. And uh, it's uh, uh, charts, uh, chart of Palooza of uh, a whole bunch of data showing why 1971 was such a seminal year uh, in terms of changing the trends for sort of life as we know it. So anyways, um, to answer your request, we have brought on the two co-founders of that website for today's program. Um, it's Ben Prentice and his business partner, Colin. Guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us, man. It's a pleasure. All right, guys. Well, um, on your website, you guys have uh, present, uh, presented a parade of charts that show the trend lines of a mind-bogglingly large number of data sets uh, that show that uh, those trajectories changed in the early 70s, early 1970s, with 1971 appearing to be sort of the seminal year of the direction change for most of those data sets. And it's crazy. We see it in, uh, in just about everything. Um, we see it in, in personal income in uh, the national debt, in uh, stock prices and valuations, in the rise of political partisanship, um, in increase in divorce rates. Heck, we even see it in the, the rise in um, uh, both obesity and in uh, lawyers per capita. I mean, it's almost any kind of metric you can think of here. So um, I got a bunch of questions for you guys. Um, right before we dive into them, I just want to quickly introduce uh, Mike Preston and John Lodra. They are the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, uh, the endorsed financial advisor by Peak Prosperity. They join me every week for these videos. Uh, Mike and John, good to have you here, guys. Hey, Adam, good to be here. Hi, Adam, good to be here. Hi, Colin and Ben. Great, and Colin and Ben, they may have some questions for you too as we jump in here. But um, guys, just to get started, so um, can you just tell me, um, A, a little bit about your guys' backgrounds, but what drove you guys to create this website? Um, and how did you come to uh, identify the importance of that specific year, 1971? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, so, I mean, Colin and I are just kind of uh, economic nerds at this point. We're armchair economists, if you will. Um, we've kind of got into the rabbit hole of, um, of, of broken money. And, and our, our thesis is that money broke in, in 1971. It finally really broke. And in doing a little bit of research, you know, um, you can go on Wikipedia around uh, 1971, the, the Nixon shock and the end of Bretton Woods. And you'll actually find a few of the charts um, that we have on this website. And we started to collect more and more of them that kind of had this inflection point in the data and started kind of making that thesis that, you know, when we went off the gold standard completely, you know, the last bastion we had of, of a gold standard, that there was an inflection point in a lot of what we would call more key KPI metrics than maybe GDP or unemployment. And um, it, the, we, we started to amass a, such a large collection of these that when we had discussions with people on the internet, um, Colin's idea was just throw it up on a website and, and kind of just ask people it, what WTF happened, right? Um, so that's really kind of the genesis story of the, of the site. All right, so you guys, uh, I'm assuming just looking at you guys on camera, you guys weren't even born in 1971. Um, I have the distinction of having been born that year, in fact. Uh, so Ben, you, you mentioned 
going off the gold standard, which happened in mid-August of 1971. It's actually about two weeks after I was born. Um, so it's interesting for somebody like me to look at this and, and think that uh, we all think the dollars, you know, kind of been the dollar since uh, you know the country started. And the answer is it hasn't uh, been that way. It's actually had many different incarnations, but the current one, which is technically really not backed by anything tangible, just by your full faith and the credit of, of the U.S. government, that actually started, uh, you know, as long ago as I've been alive. Um, so everything that I've known as the dollar has really been an experiment that's been running for pretty much the exact same number of days that I've been on the earth here. So um, it's interesting perspective, I think, for us to have. It's, it's, it's not this immutable currency that's never changed. It's something that's gone through a number of different iterations. And I think we're all still waiting to find out how this experiment ends. Now, you guys have been looking at a lot of the data, and the data certainly seems to say this experiment at least changed the system. Uh, things that had been going on in one direction, uh, in many ways, uh, changed direction or changed uh, rate of change, for sure, uh, after that year. Um, so, Colin, um, you know, first off, do you have anything to add to, to what Ben said in terms of just sort of the significance of this year and, and why you guys created the website? Yeah, so I would say, um, yeah, I'm almost 30. So my formative years were around the 2008 housing crisis. And, you know, becoming an adult and, and learning how to manage money and learning that, you know, you need money to make money and those types of things, you, you want to learn to get involved in equities and, and learning how to grow your wealth. And through doing things like that, if you have a naturally inquisitive mind, uh, you're going to look back at moments that you remember in your life and say, you know, why did that happen? And I think Ben and I are very similar in the sense that uh, we always like to ask why. We like to ask a lot of questions. So for me, really, it was looking back at 2008 and it was wondering why, you know, why did the markets crash? Um, and, and Ben and I, you know, really just 1971 was sort of just a, an inflection point that we would continually see in the data because uh, there's so much history in terms of monetary history, like you just said. Um, we could go back and look at, you know, a huge majority of financial panics in the United States long before, you know, the time period of Bretton Woods um, under the bimetal periods, where you could look at, you know, the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. But the common thread that we're continually finding is that it's uh, periods of inflation and then periods of credit contraction. Uh, periods of deflation, right, that cause these exacerbated boom and bust cycles that continually seem to be getting worse and worse. But on a macro scale, just looking at the data, uh, it was obvious to us that something changed in 1971, uh, which, you know, should be pretty obvious to anybody who looks at these macro trends closely. All right, and uh, I, I want to dive into actually some of the charts that you guys have put on your site. But but before you do, I'm I'm going to go um, gonna take a left turn for a second. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm so glad to have you guys on the program today is uh, here at PeakProsperity.com. We we do get a lot of people from time to time, you know, asking us uh, to involve the millennial community more uh, and to you know take the messages that we talk about at Peak Prosperity, which are um, the unsustainable of our economic system, our monetary system, our energy systems, a lot of the things that we're doing with resources and the environment as well. And um, I think people rightly say, uh, hey, you know, the people who are really going to have to live through the full impact of those trends are the millennials and the generations even younger to them than them. They need to hear this information. They need to get engaged. Um, I, I first want to kind of commend you guys for, you know, being economic nerds and really driving into this data because uh, there's a lot of uh, Gen Xers and boomers that actually don't understand this stuff and are just uh, happy to assume that everything is going to, you know, uh, continue to exist the way that it's always been in their lives. Um, and, uh, so first off, it's, it's great to see, you know, folks from the millennial generation as engaged in this as you guys are. I guess my question to you is, is do, you, do you see that others of your age are thinking similarly? Or is this something that, um, you know, is, is only a relative few folks in your, of your generation are paying attention to yet? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Adam. Um, I, I think that, you know, especially this year, uh, it has become more apparent that um, maybe the general understanding of what's really happening with our money system um, might 
be of importance to people. People are kind of starting to put put their ears up a, a lot like they did in 2008, I think. You know, people were like, oh, they're printing trillions of dollars. They're bailing out the, remember it was bailing out the banks and nobody's bailing out Main Street, right? Bailing out Wall Street. And and today, I, I think you're starting to kind of see that again. People are looking around and, and, and saying, wait, they printed $5 trillion in March? Like one month? And, and what does that mean? And where does that money come from? And wait, if they can print that much money, well, why do I pay taxes? And, 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 you know, and, and I actually are, I am seeing people that aren't economic nerds asking those questions. And I think that's a, I mean, it's not good that they're printing $7 trillion or whatever it is, but it is good that people are asking questions. And sometimes it takes, you know, something bad happening before people start to question whether or not what we're doing is working. Um, and I think that kind of plays along with the theme of the site. I, I would add to that that there's been what seems like a little bit of a renaissance in uh, classical Austrian theory uh, amongst my age group. You know, Ben's a little older than me, but amongst our age group, I guess I could say, and, and younger. But I wouldn't say that it's it's not a dominant narrative by any means. Uh, but there's certainly uh, been a renaissance in you know people diving back into all the way back to adam smith but up until you know primarily like mises and rothbard uh schools of thought that really mainstream doesn't touch on whatsoever uh, particularly in education like you know I, I never learned who ludwig von mises was growing up uh but finding out that th they've become sort of taboo you know like the, the alice shrugged taboo um there's sort of that forbidden fruit aspect but on then the other side something that we see a lot with our website is people using it to push uh, ulterior political narratives to our own, which we expect because we intentionally leave the website vague and open to interpretation um, because we want it to generate discussion and we don't want to stifle discussion and because we think that in the free marketplace of ideas, the best ideas will ultimately win. Uh, unfortunately, the side effect of that is that you see a lot of people pushing ideas like universal basic income, um, you know, larger government subsidies, greater redistribution of wealth, those types of things using our data. Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't say that it's a dominant narrative, this, this revival of classical economic thinking. Um, well, that's so fascinating, Colin. And um, I, I really hand it to you guys. Uh, I, I see a lot of similarities in, in this discussion with discussions that we've been having for the past 10 plus years on on the peakprosperity.com website in terms of educating people about how money is created. Uh, because as, as you said, Colin, uh, our education system doesn't, doesn't tell people uh, that. In fact, uh, you know, much of economics, let alone classical economics, like you're talking about, um, you know, isn't, uh, isn't really taught, at least not, uh, you know, at, at the, uh, anything below the undergraduate level. Uh, so unless you're going to become an economics major, most people don't, don't get a background in this. Um, all right, so uh, you know, I, I assume, and, and we'll get to this maybe near the end here, but um, I assume that one of the things that's sort of driving that renaissance amongst a subset of folks your age is probably cryptocurrencies, that revolution, and, and understanding them as a different form of money, and why is that important? Well, you really need to figure out you know, what the shortcomings of fiat currency are uh, to, to really appreciate what a cryptocurrency could do. Uh, I see you nodding there, Colin, so that sounds like that's probably true. Uh, before we go there, um, I do want to talk about the data just for a moment. So I, I ran through a whole panoply of, of different data sets you guys have there, because it is almost kind of like the kitchen sink. Um, you know, of those data sets on your website, um, you know, particularly looking at it, um, if somebody of your generation who is looking at, you know, decades and decades of, of having to live through this uh, going forward, what are the what are the data sets that have you the most worried? Um, ben, why don't we start with you there? Like, wh which ones have you most concerned as you feel like this one's going to be a big problem for me and my generation as we as we age from here? Um, the, probably the biggest one uh, would be the working hours to buy uh, the S and P five hundred. I think that uh, I I wish I had working hours to buy real estate. I don't think we have that as one of the charts, but I think it's pretty much the same chart. And the problem is, you know, my generation has been pretty much priced out of real estate unless you have a, a really good job and you've been saving for a really long time and you, you can get up thirty grand for a down payment and you know, eight, eight months of, of, uh, of mortgage payments. Um, 
and and that that problem is a problem of inflation. It, it's very simple, right? And and that's really what the the end uh, end of the hard money era and the beginning of the easy money era has brought us is is when when money is easy to create, they're always going to create more of it. And then it's and then you don't have to have an economics degree to understand supply and demand. When there's more supply of money, well, the the price changes, right? And 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 that is a problem because prices are are an aggregate of you know the market that's not something that you can set and they communicate value and when you're manipulating supply of money you're manipulating um that measure that we use for value and 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 therefore uh, this inflationary uh, paradigm that we've been living in for the last 50, uh, five decades 50 years um has has destroyed it kind of goes to the other chart which is um, the debt chart, right? And then there's a there's a savings chart as well. And what you see here is that debt is it ballooned, you know, um, in in non World War eras, it's ballooned past that right now. Uh, and savings has been declining. And we found out this year that having no savings is not very good either. So I just think that we've kind of set ourselves up for uh, disaster. You know, we have no savings. We have way too much debt, and we can't afford to buy basic things. And the the prices of everything have been distorted, and uh, that that terrifies me. You know, that's really well said, Ben. And um, you know, it's 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 even sort of more nefarious than that uh, than just sort of pure inflation, because um, the people who benefit from that inflation are the people who have first access to that newly printed money. Um, and so you've got some charts on your site there that show the um, growth in wealth inequality. Uh, and how that's been getting exacerbated, uh, particularly as of late, um, and so that's a natural out, you know, uh, output of, of of you know that easy money that you're talking about. The other thing you talked about with with savings, you know, not only are things getting more expensive, um, you know, uh, on a relative basis for people to afford, right? It's a lot harder to buy the S and P now. It's a lot harder to buy a house. It's a lot harder to buy most most things. Um, but you talked about the lack of savings. Um, you know, it's it's hard to save because things are so expensive, but it's also hard to save because you get no return on your savings, right? When the Federal Reserve is intervening the way that it is right now, and it's keeping interest rates at, you know, zero, uh, at, at literally thousand year, you know, historical lows, um, savers are punished for trying to save, right? So there's actually a big disincentive to save. Um, and of course, what that does to people who have capital that they could put into savings, they're pushing it out on the risk curve to be able to get some sort of return on that savings, which might work in the short term. But you know, if, if you're creating sort of asset price bubbles through all this intervention, um, when they correct, obviously people out in the risk curve lose the money that they had out there. So it's, it's a really, really tough road. I keep saying on this program, it's one of the most treacherous times for investors, but I think it's really one of the hardest times, um, at least in the past hundred years, for um, you know, people to amass capital and to basically build a financial future. And I know that you know, that's totally near and dear to the millennials who are at the capital formation critical point in their lives right now and having a real tough time with that. Um, all right, so uh, Colin, I'm gonna uh, move us along here on the, the questions here because I know we've got limited time with you guys. Um, you know, above and beyond what Ben said, um, you know, what do you see as sort of the most concerning uh, ramifications of these data sets going forward and I'll tie this with another question too which is um, are, are there any policies that that you and Ben would you know strongly advise you know if you had the ear of, of the folks on Capitol Hill uh, policies you think that the US should adopt going forward to mitigate some of the, the risks that these trajectories are creating sure so on that first part um the most important impact here, and you guys kind of already touched on this, I'm just going to say it in a slightly different way, is, is the impact on economic calculation, right? With our artificially low discount rates, artificially low interest rates, uh, the replacement cost of capital is effectively zero, right? And the replacement cost of assets is astronomically high. And it's why everybody benefits disproportionately. Those with more assets in an inflationary environment win. Right. Those with fewer assets or those who have to save in cash lose. They're effectively taxed, double taxed, stealth taxed, whatever you want to call it, um, by the creation of your money. Like you said, the, the concept you referred to, the Cantillion effect of uh, those that are closest to the money spigot benefit disproportionately. Right. And this is something that Ben and I try to explain to people, but it's difficult to wrap your mind around is that uh, an, an inflationary monetary paradigm, 
must redistribute wealth disproportionately, right? It cannot redistribute wealth equally or else then you're just changing the unit of account. You have to redistribute wealth uh, unequally to people. Uh, but, but this effectively zero replacement cost of capital completely disrupts the economic calculation paradigm. And it's why you see companies like Apple, extremely cash rich companies, taking out billion dollar loans to buy back equity. Why do they do that? Well, it's because the economic model has been disrupted. It's because the replacement cost of capital is zero. They're better off financially engineering their equity value than by taking that money and investing it in profitable entrepreneurial activity. Uh, it's extremely profound and it, it really disrupts society down to its core. Uh, and, and really, you know, there's a lot more going on here, but really that's all it is, is, is the replacement cost of capital affecting the entrepreneurial process and uh, poor people who aren't able to acquire assets can't benefit from that. And then in regards to your second question, uh, can you, can you remind me what, what that was? Uh, it was just, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and change some policies going on in, in Washington to help address some of these issues, right. are there any particular policies that you would recommend or push? Yeah, I, I think that these lessons were learned over a century ago, and, and in many cases, probably multiple centuries ago. Um, I, I would point people to Lionel Robbins, you know, the liquidationists following the Great Depression. Um, liquidate the banks, liquidate the farmers. Nobody likes liquidation as such. That's what Lionel Robbins said, but it has to happen. It's inevitable. Misa said the same thing. You have to rip the bandaid off, right? The longer you post postpone the liquidation of malinvestment and the liquidation of uh, booms brought on by monetary and credit expansion, the worse it's going to be. So I understand when people say, you know, we have to print the money. The Fed doesn't have the choice. If they don't do it today, like people would lose everything. Well, we're careening towards the 10,000 foot waterfall and it's sort of up to us how we proceed. Um, it's going to be bad because of the, the decisions that we've made in terms of monetary policy. So we've got to stop you know, the government subsidy, we've got to stop the money printing, we've got to stop the credit expansion, we have to stop the manipulation of interest rates, and we have to let the free market uh, take back control of capital markets. Uh, hallelujah. Um, and uh, I, I, I apologize for sort of making you guys sort of poster children for the millennials uh, in this interview, you're smart guys in your own right, regardless of your age. Um, but I got to tell you, you're, you're really giving me a shot of optimism, um, as we're having this conversation. Um, you know, hearing, uh, you know, not only the, the knowledgeable views, but just how well you're articulating them as well. Um, I, I think everybody, you know, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of boomers uh, and, and even people in older you know, generations uh, in our audience. Um, I myself am Gen X. And, uh, you know, it's not hard for people to sort of slip into generalities. Uh, older generations always think the world's going to hell in a handbasket when they look at the younger generations. And it's great to see that there are, are torchbearers like you guys uh, that are asking the same questions, focused on the same issues, and advocating for the same changes that, that, that a lot of us uh, older folks who've been sort of watching the system collapse for a bit longer are, are, are uh, advocating for as well. So I just want to express that my gratitude and, and, and just I'm impressed with you guys. So thank you. Um, real quick, uh, John uh, from New Harbor's got a question. I'm going to let him ask it in just a second. I just wanted to underscore one thing you said, Colin, because I completely agree with it, is um, you talked about you know financial engineering. You used Apple as an example. Completely agree. That's, that's pretty much all that's going on in the system these days is just financial en engineering, um, you know, tortuous uh, accounting uh, gimmicks and tricks uh, just to be able to put you know more dollars in the hands of the people that are running the system and it's really because our system has become way over financialized and when you have too much financialization um, it basically supplants actual value creation and so the way the system is running right now is it's really running is basically a game that just takes capital from one pocket or many pockets and, and moves them into other pockets. And they generally tend to be the, the pockets of a few or the pockets of the big corporations or the people that own them. Um, we are, we are in an economy right now that is, um, you know, so focused on financialization and, and so deprioritizing actual value creation that it just undermines, you know, the whole reason for having an economy and the value that economy is supposed to provide. So uh, great observation. Just wanted to underscore that. All right, John, it looks like uh, you had a question there for these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ben and Colin. Hey, I really appreciate all your, your comments and observations. It's really, I like what Adam said. It's very, very encouraging to, to see younger folks, um, 
you know, kind of looking open eyed and asking the right questions. Um, really, really encouraging. I have two sons that aren't too much younger than you. And uh, I remember my older son, when he got his first paycheck and his first job, he might've been 13 years old. He asked me if it was in the week, shortly after the week of the fire, you know, the housing crisis, um, which we're still digging out of, frankly, in my opinion. Um, he asked if it was safe to put his money in the bank. And, and I kind of had a, a, a smile of uh, pride that came over because he was asking that question. And you obviously are asking much more profound questions, but I think you're, you're doing a great service for your for the broader community and your peer group. Uh, so so um, thank you for that. And kind of as Adam said, we don't want to hold you out as poster children for everybody in your generation because the question I have is that there is kind of this meme of Robin Hood and the Robin Hood trader, which at least the stereotype that has kind of surfaced is um, you know, young people in their 20s and 30s, you know, having, you know, jobs that have, have begun to give them some um, discretionary income that they can divert to things like investing. And you know, the perception or the, the stereotype is that these young people are you know, plowing into Robin Hood, Robin Hood more as a social media game, maybe, than, than true informed investing and chasing high-flying tech stocks and taking on way more risk than they even realize, you know, with speculative things like uh, speculative uses of options and things like that. Can you comment, um, you know, on your observation as a similar age demographic, what you see there, and, and maybe you even know people that kind of are caught up in that fray? Um, perhaps not. Yeah, no, John, I'm happy to jump in on that one. Um, I, I think, you know, this, the younger generation just puts everything on social media anyway, and that's nothing interesting. But uh, Adam touched on this already, that, that this system that we have is, is pushing, um, it, you know, think, think about it this way. You could talk to a financial advisor. And the first thing they're going to tell you is don't hold U.S. dollars. And what the Federal Reserve has been telling not only individuals but companies for the last 50 years is do anything but save money. Uh, because if you do, we will punish you with inflation. Um, and, you know, he also touched on this financialization thing. And, and Adam, I just would like to clarify that, you know, it's not that we have too much financialization. It's that that is the game, right? So that's the game that has been laid out. So if you don't play that game, you're losing. And it, that starts to become pretty obvious to anybody who is trying to think about the future. And what this paradigm is, is, is presented to my generation is that if you don't gamble, right, if you don't, they, they call it investing, but I just call it gambling at this point, um, that you don't gamble with your savings, then you will not succeed, right? So that's, I mean, that's the paradigm. So you might as well go for the gold. We've got nothing to lose. Buy some Tesla and hope for the future. You mean buy some Tesla calls and hope for the future, right? <laughs> Maybe. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. I would echo that. Um, I, I think it's mostly degenerative gambling, and, and it's what your odds of going long on, you know, Tesla or whatever it is. Say you're just buying S and P calls. Uh, your your odds of doubling your money or tripling your money or whatever it is that you're trying to do are a heck of a lot better than if you're playing Powerball and. Well, I mean, you know, maybe you give up going to the bar a few times a week or whatever it is that, that you do and you give up some of that discretionary income and you throw it at something that might make you rich. And if nothing else, hey, maybe your Twitter followers get a laugh out of it. I mean, it, it's kind of, um, I'm trying to think of the word, um, nihilistic in a way. And millennials are very nihilistic. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of hopeless, you know, and, and that, that's really kind of why you see it play out in a way where, you know, a divergence of, of millennials that, that they're not interested in value investing. They're not investing for the future. They're not investing in companies that have cash flow. They don't care. They're just trying to get lucky. That's really all it is because they have no hope. And it doesn't matter anymore, right? I mean, the, the, the global economy is in the worst place it has ever been in the stock market is jumping to all time highs. It's no surprise that Davy Day Trader over there has millions of followers because it's absolute madness, right? You can't look away. It's like a slow motion train wreck. I, I can't believe it. Yeah, us, us older guys, uh, we know exactly what you're saying. Um, and this is exactly what you, you see and hear during uh, a, a, a you know, late stage bubble. Um, it just seems like it'll never end. Um, its job is to basically beat down anybody that is suspicious of it so that everybody gets on the train. And of course, once the last 
and greatest fool jumps on the train, the train then goes off the rails and it's disastrous for everybody. But we know exactly what you guys are saying. Um, all right, guys, so as we approach uh, the close here, because um, uh, you guys have given us way more time than I, I had expected, so thank you for that. Uh, just a couple quick parting uh, questions. Um, and you can keep these short, they don't, they don't have to be long. Um, but one is, um, we mentioned crypto really briefly. I actually didn't have a question around crypto, but um, I, I know that you guys are involved in some way uh, with covering crypto as well. And um, I, I guess my question to you is, is what, if anything, would you say to the audience here? We've got some people that are invested in cryptos, but I would say the vast majority of people aren't in them. Uh, it's not that they're against them. They probably just don't feel they understand them well enough right yet. But uh, how much of a role in the future do you think cryptocurrency uh, will play, should play. So I think cryptocurrency is a scam, um, an affinity scam. I think that Bitcoin is the only legitimate iteration of, uh, of cryptocurrency, so to speak. Uh, I, th I think that anything else after that is penny stocks, uh, penny stocks with massive overvaluation and hype marketing dollars and, and deep pockets and, uh, degenerate gambling. Um, but if you really want to look at world changing technology, something that has the potential to disrupt um, and potentially offer a lifeboat to a lot of these problems that we're seeing happen, um, you know, look at look at how fast iPhones took the world. Look at how fast social media took the world. Look at how quickly information spreads our world today and how fast things can change seemingly overnight. Um, and do your homework on Bitcoin because uh, it, it is a fundamentally world-changing technology. And I guarantee you, I promise you this, that if you're objective about it and if you spend time digging into it um, beyond you know, surface level price predictions and silly articles that come from the mainstream media, you will find that uh, there are some things that are very difficult to refute. Yeah, I, I definitely echo all that. Um, and, and I would like to point out that, you know, the, the the way that we got to be here was not that we sat around in a room one day and calling we're like let's be you know money economic nerds we we heard about bitcoin and i i heard about it many many years ago and it only when the price started going up i you know in 2017 i was like i i need to understand what's going on with this thing and that is a very deep rabbit hole and that's what led us here is truly asking that question what is money um, it emerges on a free market. It just is an emergent phenomenon in any free market. And um, it, it can't be dictated by fiat um, because then it, it doesn't solve the problems that it's supposed to solve. But what, what are those problems? You have, really have to ask all those questions and, and in order to verify whether or not um, this, this thing, this Bitcoin thing that has um, you know, appeared uh, is actually, wh whether it could be a viable money. And uh, if you truly ask that and, and ask from first principles, um, you have to do a lot of research because there's so much misinformation and so much um, Keynesian misunderstanding of, of what money is and what it should be. And uh, I think that's probably, that part of it's probably really obvious to your, um, your audience. So I do implore that they, uh, they do take the time um, and, and find the really good resources and, and not just the uh, crypto, you know, dollar or money go up uh, uh, there's a lot of those on YouTube. So you really have to dig. Yeah. Um, well, guys, well said. Um, and for folks watching, um, we will be bringing on uh, one, maybe two uh, sort of crypto, or I probably should say blockchain experts. Because um, to Colin's point, um, it's really the underlying technology that I think uh, has the you know, potential to sort of transform uh, the way the world works. Um, but anyways, we're going to have a couple of what, what we hope and believe are, are some of the more, um, you know, level-headed, credible minds in this space uh, coming on to sort of help uh, educate and demystify what's going on in that space. Um, all right, guys. So as we wind down here, um, uh, I'm going to do the, the whole treat you guys uh, as spokespeople again for your generation. But as I said, we got a lot of non-millennials watching here who I think, again, are, are, have been really impressed by you guys. But is there anything that you would want people of older generations uh, to know, uh, either about your work or, um, you know, just sort of the way that millennials see the world that, that you haven't shared already. Because um, I think uh, we understand that um, 
you know, it's, it's really easy to get dejected uh, looking forward uh, to what's coming down in the next couple of decades. And we completely understand that the millennials have more reason to be more dejected uh, than the rest of us because they're kind of inheriting a lot of the problems um, and uh, being told to take the weight of it all on their shoulders. And as you guys sort of intimated earlier, you know, sort of nihilistic uh, mood that's arising is probably because they just don't feel like, you know, the, the cards are so stacked against them uh, that Jesus, why even try at this point? So anyways, is, is there anything that you think, you know, us older folks should understand about uh, what your generation is trying to grapple with here that we haven't already talked about? Yeah, I would say that the, um, you know, it's, it's funny because the millennial and boomer thing kind of have like a lot of tension and then Gen X and for a lot of millennials, maybe probably not millennials, but like Gen Z and younger, they just assume that Gen X is the same thing as boomer and they like lump them all together. And they're like, you know, they all think that, that millennials and, and Gen Z are lazy and live at their parents' basement and don't want to work and just want to collect unemployment. And that's probably true in, in some cases. And yeah, you know, we were the generation where everybody got a trophy. Um, but that is not the norm. That is not the trend. You know, like the, there are plenty of hardworking, normal people that just want to work hard in life and reap the fruits of their own labor. Um, and, and in terms of like what I would say to, to my generation, you know, I'm remarkably optimistic about the future because humanity is incredibly resilient. Uh, look at the things that we've done throughout history, right? We've, we came from nothing. I mean, the default state is poverty. That's what Thomas Sowell says. And we have created all of this through the work of our hands, right? So don't be so quick to throw it all away and say, well, you know, let's just return to nothing uh, because that's not better. That's not, that's not an improvement over where we are, uh, how far we've come. Really well said. Ben, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to seem like the Bitcoin shill. It's, it's funny because we get invited on some of these places that are obviously you're not a, a Bitcoin podcast. Um, uh, but I think what gives me hope about the future is that I think Bitcoin solves the problems of gold. We, we believe that this website, WTF happened in 1971, is a demonstration of the failure of gold. Gold failed as money. And a lot of the people that I think are smart enough to understand a lot of these economic concepts um, that are among your crowd um, have been you know, saying, oh, well, this is why we need to go back to gold. No, this is this this website demonstrates how one politician with a stroke of his pen destroyed the world's economic system. And to understand how Bitcoin could improve upon that and protect us against that is a very difficult question to answer. But I do implore that you take the time to understand it because this, like like Colin said, is maybe one of those gradually then suddenly types of things. And it may be our our, our only chance at sound money. All right. Well, guys, thanks again so much for coming on. Um, uh, again, really encouraged uh, and, and impressed, as I've said a couple of times. Um, I, I will make this public offer to you guys. Um, you know, we've got a lot of data here at peakprosperity.com. We've got a lot of people uh, that come and, uh, and grapple with a lot of the issues that we're talking about here. Uh, again, as I said earlier, a lot of these people are a little bit older, um, but they've got a lot of wisdom and they've got resources. And so um, if we at Peak Prosperity can help you guys in getting your message out, particularly in opening eyes in younger generations, um, you've got my full uh, commitment to do whatever we can to help you guys. So just, just ask. Um, and on a related note, if the people watching here want to learn more about you guys and your work, where should they go? Best place is probably on Twitter. Ben and I are both on Twitter. Um, I'm at heavily armed C like the letter C and Ben is at Mr. Cool BP, but really uh, probably our website WTF happened in 1971. You know, we update it on a regular basis. We try to, it's kind of like a living document and don't, don't take it too seriously. Right. Cause it, it is just a meme. Um, it's designed to shock and awe uh, and it's designed to create conversation, but we've also started a newsletter uh, which you can find on that website or you can go to WTF 1971 uh, which which is a bit more serious discussion you know economic history theory those types of things so if people want to learn more I would say that that's a good uh, first place for them to go you know if they're really into what what Ben and I have to say all right guys well look thank you so much for giving us so much of your time um, really looking forward to seeing what you guys do next 
And um, I'd love to have you guys back on the programming program at some point uh, in, in the future. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to get a bunch of, uh, of really encouraged, uh, uh, you know, uh, positive comments to get you guys back on and how impressed folks were uh, from you. So uh, anyways, if you're open to it, I'd love to have you guys back on maybe in a couple of months. Thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Take care. Now, John and Mike, um, uh, let's, uh, let, let's pivot from this great conversation uh, to talking about the markets, which uh, I think are less exciting than, uh, you know, the, what the future generation has in store for us. Um, but hey, what a great couple of guys, huh? Yeah, it was a great, great conversation. Really, really impressive. Uh, really impressed with those guys and their, their research. Yeah, it was really good to, to meet Ben and Colin and to hear their perspective, you know, what, what the 30-somethings or the millennials are thinking right now. And, and just listening to him talking about, uh, you know, his peers saying, the heck with it. I'll just take a few bucks and buy some calls in the S&P or Tesla. You know, if it works out, great. I, you know, I can get ahead. If not, well, at least I've got something to write about on Twitter. I mean, it's literally the definition of, herd mentality you know we've been seeing it every day every week every month all year long and um, you know it's a definition of a giant bubble that we're in and um, there's been some gains made along the way but uh, we think that it's probably going to end badly and, and those gains are going to be given back and in, in short order it may already be happening yeah and that's that's what's you know it was heartbreaking to hear and i think that's what a you know a, a decade-long asset uh, price bubble gets you right i mean these kids that are in their late 20s uh, for their adult lives, so they've had nothing but uh, you know liquidity getting pumped into the system by the world central banks and whatnot. So they they don't yet know what it's like when those asset bubbles pop, and it's sad because when it does, it is certainly going to decimate their tes Tesla calls and whatever else they're buying on, on Robinhood. All right, but let's let's switch to uh, the week's activity because it's been interesting. Um, so the markets are down versus last week, um, and it's been really kind of an epic. Uh, seesaw in the markets. There have been multiple failed rallies. In fact, there were two today that that, that failed, where the market really, uh, you know, it, today it opened down big, rallied hard. Uh, at one point, I think the NASDAQ uh, and S&P were both up close to 1%. Uh, then they were down again, and they managed to close relatively flat. Um, but what it does seem to be is sort of a continuation of what we talked about last week, which is that, um, you know, the markets are, are struggling uh, to begin to, uh, you know, reverse course and, and get back to going higher. And, uh, and yet they're just not able to. And so it's looking like this is going to be the fifth down week in a row, which honestly would have been unheard of a month ago um, after just months and months of, of not only no down weeks, but practically no down days. I think there were two in the month of August. Um, suddenly we're finding the market just, just can't seem to get its mojo back. So, um, uh, guys, uh, as you're looking at this data, what, what is it looking like to you? Uh, why don't we start with you, Mike? I mean, the market's down 2%, you know, versus uh, the end of last week, you know, or, or when we last talked at the end of last week. So it's, and just today, you know, we touched a, a correction, a technical correction of 10%. But still, we're just sitting right around the January high. And the January high was the tippity top of a giant blow off bubble that started last September with repo madness, you know, and um, valuations remain insanely high, higher than they've literally ever been. We've, we've seen blow off top after blow off top, at least seven that we've seen since the 2008 high in January. And each time the market tries to correct, the Fed pulls something out, you know, a new rabbit out of the hat, if you will. So, you know, our belief is that we fall, we, we look at the, the data, the data says that the market's extremely overvalued and we're not going to grow our way out of it. GDP is not going to magically, you know, explode upwards to save us from this valuation problem. All we have is central banks, literally all we have. And, you know, the market has been trying to correct since at least the January 18 blow off top. It's about at least over two and a half years ago now. And as interminable as it seems, it looks to us like this is just a giant topping formation. We certainly have the data to back us up on that. We've got sentiment that's euphoric off the charts to back us up on that. And, um, you know, this, this small correction here, you know, not even at the moment or 10% uh, off, the, off the high, still leaves us at very close to the most overvalued level ever seen in this country. So we're going to have to see something deeper. We haven't really seen any worry yet. Um, certainly not in, in the people we've talked to or, or you know, the, the people you might see on Twitter, the millennials, if you will, day day trader sentiment is still 
incredibly euphoric. So it's going to take a heck of a lot more to to shake. Um, I think the the you know the the, the, the foundations of this this really really historic bullish sentiment, and it's gonna it's it's probably going to happen quickly when it happens. All right. Um, with something that I think is relatively new that I'm observing is uh, I, I put out on Twitter a couple of days ago uh, where you know, the, the market was selling off and, and it was a sell off across everything. And uh, almost, literally just about every asset class uh, for no, you know, titular reason. There was no, no headline really driving it. And it, it really began smelling like um, uh, distribution, um, which is what they call it when the big players have gotten themselves positioned. Uh, they've, they've largely, um, you know, locked in their big gains and they're now heading for the door and they want to dump the over, uh, you know, overvalued positions that they have remaining onto kind of the suckers left at the table as they're kind of beginning to exit uh, the poker game. Um, and so I put that on Twitter a couple of days ago and then I saw a report today from Nomura Research that basically said the exact same thing, um, that they're seeing um, uh, you know, very large players are de-risking and, uh, and essentially, in their words, uh, now potentially turning you know, the remaining retail investors in the markets into the bag holders. Um, John, cu curious if you've got you know, any opinion on that. And, and I'm going to combine this with another question just because we're getting tight on time, which is that um, all commodities, but certainly the precious metals, have, have had a pretty rough week, uh, particularly silver in the miners. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, do, do you see this, uh, these downward prices in the metals as a change in trend, or do you see it as more likely as just sort of a healthy correction, getting some of the speculation out of the, the precious metals? I, I guess short question is, is uh, you know, is your, your uh, the attractiveness of the precious metals complex uh, diminishing at all in your eyes given the current sell-off, or do you think that's just sort of a, you know, again, a healthy, uh, letting some of the excessive air out? Yeah, no, it's not, it hasn't changed our, our view. Obviously, short term, there's been some weakness here. Dollar has been quite strong over the last week. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of help there by uh, some misconstrued comments by one of the Federal Reserve governors, you know, kind of hinting or, or misspeaking perhaps that, um, you know, uh, they might actually raise rates before uh, inflation meets the target. So a lot of confusion in the market there. So, so dollar rallied quite a bit. That usually uh, accompanies, you know, precious metals selling off. Uh, but no, we had, we had, it, it, you know, if you look at the pullback, it's, it's uh, actually right to some, some technical support levels on, say, for example, the gold mining complex, nothing at all concerning there. But, you know, um, this allows us to really kind of remind ourselves how our hedging tools can, can really be helpful in, in, in um, mitigating some of the short term um, twos and fro's. Um, we have put options, for example, on, on our gold mining stocks um, that, um, you know, are right at the level where they kick in very robustly. To, to translate that, if we had a material move further down from here in those gold mining stocks, those put options would almost immediately kick in and offset any further downside. Um, but we also use this weakness to, uh, and we, ha we have some hedges on our emerging market stock position, for example. So those hedges come in place, uh, come in play for exactly these kinds of shorter term events. Um, but we also, you know, use that weakness as an opportunity to, to book profits in some of the call options we've sold against these positions. Um, so uh, should we get a bounce from these kind of technical levels, uh, we have removed any upside cap on those, uh, those, those investments. So, you know, we, we look for re real um, actionable trading moves we can make um, when we get short term moves like this without really changing our fundamental uh, and longer term views on on sectors like the gold, gold, sil gold and silver, and mining sectors. Great, I'm really glad you touched upon the the hedges that you have in place there, because um, we've talked about those on past programs, and that's a huge reason why we endorse you guys as a financial advisor is because uh, you're so focused on capital preservation that you you buy insurance through these downside hedges, so that if you're taking on a, a, a sizable position in a portfolio, um, you're protecting it to the downside as best you can. Um, so great to hear that those are working out as planned. Um, okay, real quickly, um, you mentioned that the dollar was strengthening. I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. Um, we have been um, uh, at Peak Prosperity, and I've definitely been on Twitter, uh, letting folks know for the past month or so that the dollar looked like it was poised to pop higher and surprise a lot of people because one of the, the most one-sided trades on Wall Street this year has been the short dollar trade. 
Um, and uh, we've had two guests that have basically been predicting uh, a dollar upside surprise. That's been Sven Henrik. We've shown some of his charts. Uh, and then we had Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital on a couple of day, uh, a couple of weeks ago who talked about, you know, his thoughts on the dollar and whatnot. So I just want to just want to give those guys credit for saying, you know, that that a surprise to the upside like this was coming. Um, I, two quick observations, guys, before I let you go. One is um, uh, we're seeing more and more fraud getting exposed in the media right now. Um, companies from Wirecard uh, to Nikola, which is the Tesla competitor, um, to uh, Nano X, which was a big expose just uh, exposed by Muddy Waters Research. And I just wanted to point those out because those are really indicative of the types of malinvestment that you see when capital is as cheap as it is. And this goes back to what, what Ben and Colin were talking about. Um, and it's really at sort of the end of, of, uh, of the mania. Uh, is, is, it's really when the waters begin to recede, to borrow a quote from Warren Bucket, uh, Buffett, is when you begin to see, find out who's been swimming naked, right? Um, y you, don't, you don't see those fraud exposés uh, at the beginning or in the middle of these manias because everybody's too busy buying into the narrative and throwing money at these companies. Uh, but now that, uh, uh, you know, the purse strings are tightening a little bit, uh, we're beginning to hear from the monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus folks that they're, they're not going to be issuing as many, you know, uh, rescue packages as they were, at least not in the same sizes. All of a sudden that, that, that fraud begins to get exposed and it just uncovers all the malinvestment that happens during uh, a, a bubble mania. Um, and I think, you know, we are still, you know, in terms of uh, the, the bubble correcting, I don't even know if we're halfway through the first inning yet. Um, but I, I did just want to point that out for folks. Um, and related to that, um, we're seeing, you know, probably the most important or certainly the most storied bellwether stock, Tesla, really struggling here. Um, you know, earlier this morning, it's recovered a little bit, but, but earlier this morning, it was down to in the mid 300s, which basically is about a third uh, off of its uh, $500 all-time high price from like a month plus ago. Um, so there's now a lot of investors that have lost a, a good chunk of money in Tesla. And um, you know, all of a sudden you're beginning to see Tesla you know, kind of disappointing people um, with some of its numbers. It, it battery day was underwhelming for a lot of analysts. Um, and certainly the stock is continuing you know, to struggle. It's, it's, it's uh, meteoric uh, rise has definitely been uh, hammered down. And, and you know, I think you can make lots of arguments that future weakness may lie ahead. And so I'm pointing this out to say, hey, look, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the poster child, the favored son here uh, is now all of a sudden really looking fairly tarnished. And because Tesla was, was such uh, the emblem for this you know, rally off the March lows, um, if Tesla goes, if it really cracks further from here, I think you really got to be very concerned for where the whole big tech complex ha is headed from here. And of course, big tech is owned um, way over proportionately and so many ETFs out there that if that sector cracks, it's going to take the whole market down with it. Guys, any thoughts on any of that commentary before we close here? Mike, why don't we start with you? Okay. I was looking for my unmute button. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Sessler is the poster child for this bubble. You know, it's, it's one of many though. There's, we can go on and on and on. Yeah, Tesla's off about a third, but um, we've been around long enough, you know, um, to, to, to see the last, not just the last bubble, the 08 bubble, but the tech bubble. We were watching that, you know, some stocks, the four horsemen of that last, um, you know, that last bubble, were they Microsoft, Dell, Intel, and um, Sun Microsystems, I think, were the four horsemen. They were down close to 90%. The first, this first move that we're seeing here, uh, predictions are very difficult, but Tesla being off one third, it, it probably will not just for that stock, but for, for all of those story stocks get worse in the years ahead. So um, the euphoria that we saw here is a order of magnitude higher than ever before, including the tech bubble across the board. So yeah, we're starting to see some reversals there looking at the, the entire NASDAQ. Um, you know, we prefer to look at whole indices. The entire NASDAQ is, had a throw over out of its channel a couple weeks ago. It's down, I don't know, 15 plus percent, it looks like, just by, by, by rough eyeballing it. We think we're really, really early in what's likely to be a long bear market. So, um, this, and if it's what we think it could be, there's not gonna be a lot of places to hide other than in, in liquid reserves, you know, picking your, um, your spots carefully, 
entering maybe tactically with hedges, which is what we plan, plan to do, and um, sell volatility by using options. You know, one thing we didn't talk about this week is volatility. The VIX or the volatility index had, had been down in the low teens for years, 10, 11, 12, 13. In March, you know, the VIX went up to 85, and it's very stubbornly held up there. Sven Henrik talked about this a few weeks ago. It's been flirting with the 30 level here uh, for a couple of weeks, and it looks like it wants to break out higher. So who knows exactly what the timing is or what's going to cause it, but, but anxiety remains high in this market, and, and the level of fear remains high, even if it doesn't feel like it. Certainly, professional traders are betting that way as measured by the VIX and story stocks, story stocks are starting to falter like Tesla. So, you know, I, I would say that the, you know, the, the interesting thing about this moment, the last word I'd, I'd say about it is that very few people are concerned, you know, and I suppose that's what happens at the very tippity top of every bubble in history. So. Now, I'll right. just add, Adam, you know, kind of tops are, are usually defined by kind of this, uh, dispersion of, of uniformity. There's some stocks that are racing higher, even while underneath the surface, there are fewer and fewer stocks kind of carrying that, that weight, if you will. And the same happens in the first kind of moves down. You start to get some of these high flyers start to falter, but maybe there's some resiliency in the broader market. Um, so like a Tesla, you know, falling like it did, you know, it's a, it's a company that, you know, barely can fabricate earnings even by, you know, you know, engineering uh, regulatory credits and things like that. But when you start to see stocks like Apple, which is a huge cash generating company, overvalued, no doubt in our opinion, but a legitimate company has huge, huge cash flow, huge profitability, that's off, you know, almost 25% from its high. So, so this, that may be a more kind of, um, you know, uh, definitive measure that we may be seeing some, some of this market crush under its own weight. All right. Well, um, I'm going to let you have the last word there, John. Well said. Uh, just to um, borrow from what Mike said, uh, you, yes, many people may not be too worried right now, but I, I think the three of us would say uh, it is certainly time uh, for concern and, and at a minimum, certainly time for prudence in terms of asking yourself, hey, you know, if the market does really kind of roll over from here, am I positioned? For that. Um, all right, so I'm going to end here just with a couple quick housekeeping like we did last time. Um, first off, uh, I had a number of people take me up on the follow me on Twitter. I'm going to put my Twitter handle at Menlo Bear back up here. Um, a super helpful way for me to hear from you guys uh, who you want to have on the program. I hope you like the fact that in this program we did bring somebody that uh, the Twitter sphere had been asking for. We'll do it again. So uh, uh, let me know what you think. And again, uh, I'm oftentimes uh, sharing who's coming. We've got guests scheduled for the next couple of weeks that I've announced to the Twitter audience. I don't like to do it on the video just in case somebody's got to pull out. But if you want to know who we've got planned, again, that'll all be available on Twitter. Also, take a second if you can, but just click the like button. Um, liking these videos actually does make a difference in terms of how much they get shared on YouTube. And so uh, we want this important information to be shared far as far and wide as possible. Your likes help make that happen. Um, if you can, if you haven't yet, uh, register for the Peak Prosperity uh, 2020 seminar. We're making it digital this year. I gave a big uh, plug for it last time, so I won't this time. I'll just put up the uh, URL here to go learn more about the seminar, including how to register, and to let you know that we had been hoping that Grant Williams was going to be able to make it, um, but we weren't sure. Well, I just heard from him yesterday. He is definitely going to be participating, so really happy to say that Grant uh, will be one of our presenters because he's one of the best out there. Um, and then last, um, if you have not yet done so, consider, strongly consider scheduling a free consultation with John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Uh, I gave a little anecdote last week about uh, getting a dental x-ray and sort of, you know, said, hey, you should get a portfolio x-ray. I had a surprising number of people reach out to me who have been Peak Prosperity members for years and years and years saying, you know what, I, I just, for whatever reason, have been busy, never got around to it, but I finally reached out to those guys. Thanks for the prod. And it, it just it reminded me, I, I'm always surprised at how many years somebody can be watching these videos or, or hearing our you know, uh, offer of this free uh, portfolio review that the guys at New Harbor do, um, and, and how long it sometimes takes, folk, uh, for, takes for folks to take us up on that. And we get it. You know, life gets in the way. We all get busy and whatnot. But this is a completely free, uh, high-value 
opportunity for you. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to work with these guys. It's really just having you know a smart professional financial advisor who understands the risks that we talk about in these videos, look at your personal situation, and give you feedback. And if you want to take it and implement it on your own, great. If you want to work on it with another financial advisor, great. Or if you like these guys and want to work with them, great. But there's just no downside to actually doing it. So anyways, if you have any interest in that, stick around at the end of the video here. We give you all the instructions on how to do it. And John and Mike, I'll put up the, uh, the URL whenever you guys are talking so folks know how they can you know, fill out the form to reach out to you. And with that said, guys, uh, another great uh, video here. I'm super excited for who we have lined up for next week's guest. Uh, I know you guys know who it is, but uh, John and Mike, but I'm going to let the audience here uh, stir in uh, not knowing uh, so they can be as delightfully surprised as, as I think they will be when, when this guest comes on. Um, and uh, with that, guys, I'll see you next week. Take it easy, Adam. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Adam. We really appreciate your effort in putting these together every week. We'll see you soon. Take care, guys. Bye. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to graylockpeak.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given the latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Peak Prosperity has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. Chris and I started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration and are looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or just downright ridiculed by the standard sort of financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type, the kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market's always going to take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing which is why we strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, just as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you aren't, or you're having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. And for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Peak Prosperity and New Harbor, which we had to put in place to make sure that everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the graylockpeak.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to graylockpeak.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.